Less than three weeks remain until primary day in Iowa. Where do Democrats running for governor stand on the issues? We gather six candidates here at Iowa Public Television for this special live Iowa Press debate. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is a special Iowa Press debate, live from Iowa Public Television's Maytag Auditorium in Johnston. Here is moderator David Yepsen. In the past half century of Iowa politics, Democrats have held Iowa's governorship for only a dozen years. The men and women standing behind podiums at IPTV tonight are all seeking the Democratic nomination for governor in a primary election only three weeks away. They are Kathy Glosson, a registered nurse and union leader from Coralville. Ross Wilburn, a former mayor of Iowa City. Dr. Andy McGuire, a Des Moines resident and recent chair of the Iowa Democratic Party. Nate Bolton, a state senator representing Des Moines. Fred Hubble, a businessman from Des Moines, and John Norris, a former chief of staff to Governor Tom Vilsack, who also resides in Des Moines. Now, we've expanded this program to 90 minutes in an effort to accommodate additional issues and questions among all six candidates, similar to Iowa Press. There are no set time limits, and candidate interaction will, as well and uh, as follow-up questions are at my discretion and our fellow panelists here. We hope for a spirited and thorough debate uh, of Iowa issues. Joining the conversation are political reporters Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa and James Lynch of the Gazette. Well, first of all, I want to start the questions just by thanking all of you for offering yourselves for public service. I know something about uh, the life you lead on a campaign trail, so I want to thank you for that. I also hear from a lot of people who ask me, who's going to win? I don't know who they are. Uh, so let's open our conversation this evening, and I'll start with you, John Norris, and we'll give everyone time to answer this question. Who are you? How do you differentiate yourself from these other candidates? And maybe why are you the most electable in November? Good. Thank you, David. Who am I? I'm a Southwest Iowa farm kid uh, who's done work over my life in government, business, and politics. I was chief of staff to Governor Vilsack. I was chair of the Iowa Utilities Board. I've owned a restaurant business, and now I own a small business in Des Moines. I was head of the State Farm Utility Coalition in the farm crisis in the 1980s. Uh, served in the Obama administration as the U.S. representative to the United Nations for ag policy and as a federal energy commissioner. I've spent my life fighting for economic and social justice. I believe to win this election, we have to have someone who's experienced in managing in government. I've managed at the state and federal level and in business, particularly because Kim Reynolds' mismanagement of our government is what we have to draw a distinction on. And to go against her, we need someone who actually can gain the trust of Iowans that we're ready to step in day one and straighten out the mess that she's created. Mr. Hubble. Thank you. So I'm a fifth generation Iowan and a lifelong progressive Democrat. I used to work in the private sector, run the Yonkers department store business in the 1980s during the farm crisis. After that, I was in charge of Equitable Life Insurance Company of Iowa with agencies all across Iowa and the rest of the country. Then Governor Culver asked me twice to go to work for state government. The first time was to lead the Iowa Power Fund, the, board, the chair of the board of directors there. For four years, we, made, we looked at 400 different investments, invested in 60 of those to help Iowa continue to be a leader in renewable energy and renewable fuels all across Iowa. Then we had the, the uh, film tax credit scandal, Department of Economic Development. Governor Culver asked me to go in there and fix the film tax credit scandal, and we did. We saved Iowans millions of dollars. So I've had a long career in both the private sector and the public sector delivering results. But my wife and I have also been very busy 
in the, in, the, in the community we call Iowa. I used to chair the Planned Parenthood board. I chaired the Simpson College board, the Iowa College Foundation board. My wife and I helped Broadlands General Hospital expand their mental health services. She and I have both worked in the environmental area, trying to improve our air and water quality for the last 10 or 12 years. Unfortunately, we haven't made enough progress in that area, but we've worked hard at it. So I think I'm, the, I'm a kind of a candidate that's got a lot of experience in the public and private sector delivering results, but I've also worked to support and improve the quality of life and the progressive values that make Iowa a special place. Nate Bolton. I'm Nate Bolton. I'm the state senator who represents East Des Moines and Pleasant Hill in the Iowa Senate. But I actually grew up in southeast Iowa. Columbus Junction is my hometown. Uh, my mom and stepdad still live on a heritage farm just outside of Columbus Junction, rural Louisa County. When we start talking about this election and the opportunity Democrats have here, we have a state that's on the brink. And when we start talking about how we are going to win in November, it's going to be narrowing that divide, urban versus rural, and bringing people together on our shared values, something I've been proud to do in the Iowa Senate, standing up to some extreme legislation, uh, standing with so many Iowans who are ready to stop fighting back and start pushing forward to a new vision for Iowa's future. We do that by showing Iowans that we share values in terms of fully funding our schools, making sure our economy works for everyone, doing the things we can to protect our natural resources while making sure Iowa feeds the world as well. When we talk about health care, it's an Iowa value to take care of each other. Those are the things that I've been proud to fight for in the Iowa Senate, and I didn't wait for the Iowa Senate to, to start standing up to this administration. I'm proud of the work that I've done as a workers' rights attorney, standing up to this administration, taking them all the way to the Supreme Court when they've done things that have threatened the lives of vulnerable Iowans and demonized public employees. Andy McGuire. Well, I'm, uh, great that, it's great that you had this tonight. I'm a Waterloo native uh, from a family of eight. My dad was a World War II veteran, came home and started a construction machinery business. My mom stayed home with us. And I learned about caring about others. And, that's so important, I think, because I think people feel like we're not caring about them right now. When I go all over Iowa, that's what I hear. And that's why I became a medical doctor today, because I could see the power of caring about other people, especially when they're sick or injured. But what I hear from Iowans all the time right now is they feel like they're having profits put ahead of people. And when I hear about the issues they're concerned about, it's the privatization of Medicaid. You ask the difference between me and, and Kim Reynolds. I actually have run a Medicaid program and gotten people healthier and done it in a good way. And right now we have a mess that they've created. And I have the expertise, I believe, to really change that and help people. We have a mental health crisis and substance abuse and addiction. I've worked with that in my healthcare career. I know how to fix that. And that's what I'm hearing about all over Iowa, that people are suffering. And right now we're not doing enough about that. I've certainly been a supporter of women's health and what we've done recently with Kim Reynolds. There couldn't be a starker difference between where I stand and where Kim Reynolds stands. And then we talk about education. I've been a champion for early childhood education and making sure that every child in every zip code has good education, and I hear about that everywhere. So I think I have some unique expertise from my medical background and, ed and my education background that really make me uniquely qualified to take on Kim Reynolds and Dieter. Thank you. Ross Wilburn. I'm Russ Wilburn, and I'm a proud graduate of Davenport Central High School, so public education product. I also went to the University of Iowa and have a master's of social work there. I am the candidate who has been elected to office three times. I've got 12 years of elected experience uh, subbing, um, you know, supporting the public and public issues. So uh, I have more experience than everyone up here on, on the stage in terms of uh, elected experience. I work at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach serving Iowans uh, with our staff in all 99 counties, including youth, with agricultural programs, 4-H youth development, economic development. All of these are issues which kind of cut across what folks are here tonight. I served uh, in the Iowa Army National Guard, the 682nd Engineers in, in Danport, so I know personally and with family members who served in the Army what it's like for families to have their loved ones uh, you know, serving and the support they need when they return home. I'm also a, a proud parent and have family members that are part of the LGBTQ plus community. And uh, these and some other areas in terms of water, education, uh, diversity, inclusion are issues that are important to Iowans and part of our Let's Be Iowa campaign. And Kathy Glosson, who are you? How do you differentiate yourself? And why are you the most electable? 
Well, thank you, and thanks for having us tonight. Uh, I'm Kathy Glosson. Uh, I grew up in the northwest corner of Iowa and Spencer. Uh, my parents were uh, non-college educated. Dad was a semi-truck driver, and my mom worked at a Sears and Roebuck store. Uh, and back in those days, they both were middle-class Iowans that could raise two daughters and send us to college. Uh, this day in Iowa, that's not the opportunity that most Iowans are feeling. Uh, I'm not the typical candidate running for governor, and I'm very proud of that. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a wealthy businessman. I am not an insurance executive. Uh, I'm an intensive care unit nurse uh, for over 20 years. Uh, I'm also a union leader and an organizer. I'm also a wife, uh, a mother, and a grandmother. And I decided to run for governor because I was sick and tired of watching everyday Iowans and working people in this state getting beat up. And I believe the number one job of a governor is to raise wages and improve the standard of living for every Iowan. Uh, our campaign is about lifting up everyday Iowans to get engaged in the political process again and get them excited to go to the polls. That's why I'm running on the most bold progressive agenda of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I'm the only Democratic candidate that's come out bold and first on 15 with the shortest amount of time frame to make that happen. I'm also a union leader that believes that we need to not only expand and reverse the attacks on unions, we need to make it easier for every worker to have a union no matter where they work uh, and reverse right to work state laws. Uh, and then I'm the only Democratic candidate from day one and still will c commit to making sure that every Iowan has universal single-payer health care, uh, which unlike my opponents here today, they're great people, but no one here uh, is standing on single-payer health care. So we are clearly a different campaign. I'm clearly a different candidate. And I know together we can build a bold progressive Iowa if we let the people of Iowa lead. Thank candidate. you. And, and here to take us into some of these very issues that you all have been talking about, Kay Henderson. Candidates, let's talk specifics. As governor, you can do a lot of things. You just can't do everything. Mr. Bolton, what is the first bill that you would ask the legislator to pass if you are elected? One of the first things we have to do is start treating our workers in this state with dignity and respect again. Uh, we saw a heartless attack on workers across the board this last legislative session. We saw those answering the sacred call of public service be told they're entitled to lesser and fewer rights in the workplace than every other employee in our state. We're talking about our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, our social workers, our public health nurses, the people we need to build safe and strong communities. But it didn't stop there. It was an attack on the rights of those injured on the job, putting their bodies on the line for economic progress in our state, uh, being told that they're going to be entitled to lesser benefits if, if they suffer injuries from here on out. Uh, we saw attacks on uh, the people that make safe and, and, and secure buildings and construction projects. So we're going to get back to treating re uh, our workers with dignity and respect in the workplace, reverse those changes, and actually start making progress. So people choose to come to Iowa for a quality of life, knowing they'll be respected and have rights in the workplace. So you're going to ask them to repeal legislation that the Republican-led legislature enacted. Mr. Norris, what would be the first bill that you would ask legislators to pass? Well, the appropriations usually comes later in the process, but the most important thing we need to do is fund education. It's the backbone. When I think of Iowa values, it's love for the land, sense of community, and that fundamental belief that public education is the great equal op opportunity provider. We have just woefully inadequately funded education over the last several years in this state, and we've got some catching up to do to build a future for our children for this state. Ms. Glosson, what it would be the first bill that you would ask the legislature to uh, My first day in office, I'm going to call on the legislature to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, and as governor, I will actually use my executive authority to make sure that state contracts with our employees are at a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Um, and also ensure that any state contracts done by any companies with the state of Iowa are on a path to the $15 minimum wage for their employees as well. Uh, I will veto any anti-labor legislation that crosses my, bill, uh, crosses my desk as governor. Uh, and I'll work to make sure that the principles, anyone doing business with state government that gets any taxpayer dollars has to meet uh, guiding principles to let their workers form a union without uh, intimidation and fear. Mr. Wilburn, what is number one for you? Appropriations do come a little later in the process, but there's some things layered along with education, uh, K-12 education and higher education. We can layer in some comprehensive mental health care and make sure that it's available and accessible for uh, youth and families that are, that are struggling with untapped potential because young people are not engaged, fully engaged at school. Ms. McGuire? I would go to health care 
because we've got 600,000 Iowans who are suffering under this Medicaid mess. You know, I hear stories every day about dads whose special needs kids are going to have to be put in institutions. I hear about moms who have disabled children who have to drive an hour and a half to get them care. So I think that's really an emergency, and we need to do that right away. And that has a corollary of also helping with mental health, substance abuse, and addiction, because some of the payment methods we're doing right now are really hurting that. You know, we have 120,000 people who probably have serious mental illness in this state that we are not giving the resources to. We're 50th in mental health beds, 47th in providers, and honestly, everybody knows that we've turned our law enforcement into our first-line mental health providers. So I think that's something that I would want to do at the beginning to make sure that patients are taken care of. And Mr. Hubble. Well, the first thing I would do is not a bill. I would reverse the privatization of Medicaid on day one and start the process of bringing that back into our state. The first bill I would do is to uh, fully fund pre-K and K-12 public education. Let me, let me ask the... James, before you go to that, I, I, any, any, any of you want to react to any, anything that's been said here well, about the yeah, first I mean, priorities? I mean, obviously, John you ask for a bill of legislation, but mm -hmm. by executive action, the most important thing the governor can do, I think, in this state, and I will do day one, is as Fred said, I think we all will, reverse this privatization of Medicaid. It's a disaster, and it's hurting our most vulnerable Iowans. Okay. So it's a combination of executive action well, also and legislation. You ought to, it, it really should be a bill because we ought to be involving hearings and the legislature, which we didn't do the first time, so that we can actually take care of, of patients. Ross the piece that I would add, you know, day one is kind of a symbolic and important thing, but it starts the day after the general election. It's a process to put uh, a system in place uh, you know, to restore uh, the, both the oversight and make sure that, you know, that appropriate funding. So it actually starts the day after to put a group together to put that in place. James? This is sort of a corollary question, but uh, after two years of all GOP control of the Capitol, there are a lot of things that Democrats want to change. As governor, what would be the first thing you would want to undo, and how would you go about that? Let, let's start with you, Ms. Glosson. Uh, I think the... Um Gosh, there's so many things that have happened. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, you know, there's we we have the anti-immigration bill. We just banned uh, uh, the ability for women to access safe and legal abortions in the state. Um, the f public funding of education is a mess. Honestly, uh, James, I don't know where I would start because it is such a mess uh, driven by this uh, governor who obviously wants Iowa to be at the race of the bottom for what we're doing for uh, the people of Iowa. Um, so there is just so much to talk about. Uh, I, I honestly, I can't pick one, uh, and I, but I can give you more of a laundry list of what needs to be fixed. Ms. McGuire? I would refund, get the funding back for Planned Parenthood um, and, and reverse some of these just extreme laws that were passed against women's health. And how do you go about that? Well, I, you've got to work with the legislature to get the family um, planning waiver back. You know, this was a great waiver that helped um, poor people to get birth control, to access birth control. I was on the initiative to decrease unintended pregnancies, and what we showed was if you get affordable, accessible health care uh, for birth control, you decrease abortion. That's what we ought to be talking about, and yet we're doing just the reverse. So I would work with the legislature to get that funding back. It's a 90-10 match from the federal government to the state. We need to get that money back and be prioritizing women, not making them the bottom of John Norris? Well, obviously it takes a Democratic legislature or a more progressive legislature to change anything, which means why we have to, to win this governor's race and take back the legislature is we as Democrats have to show up with a plan for rural Iowa if we're going to win this race. We will not win the governor's race or those legislative seats unless we win back votes in rural what Iowa. What specific thing would you want to undo? I'm sorry? Undo. What so uh, if, I had, if I had the opportunity to undo. We're talking about making choices here. Yeah, it? yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that is uh, we've, we've, got to, we've got to undo uh, the, uh, this fetal heartbeat bill. It's just damaging for Iowa, not just, not just repulsive for taking away women's rights, but they're talking about us across the nation is don't go to Iowa. That's the last thing we needed for grandstanding is what's worth, it's what they're doing. Mr. Hubble? Well, the list could go on, and, and my fellow candidates have mentioned several really good ideas, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, most bills require money. We have a terrible fiscal mess in our state, and we have a lot of unfunded priorities from this legislature because they don't have the right priorities and because they're not managing the budget properly. So the first thing I want to do is make sure that we stop the wasteful tax giveaways, put caps on all the credits, exemptions, and deductions, and put sunsets on all of those things so we can stop the money going out the door 
in the back door and instead take that money and invest in education and health care and infrastructure so we can grow our economy and give people the health and education they deserve. Nick Mr. Bolton, Bolton you uh, talked about collective bargaining. Anything else you want to undo? Well, if you watch me, me in the Iowa Senate the last two years, there are plenty of things I want to undo. I was proud to stand up against a lot of things this administration did. But one of the things when Governor Reynolds was first sworn in, I called upon her to do, to show that she was different, to show she was a leader, was to actually do something about this privatized Medicaid mess that they did as a go-it-alone policy. It didn't involve the legislature, just ran down a path. She could have shown that she was going to do something about the mistakes that she later admitted were made. Didn't do it. I think we've got to prioritize on that. Ross Wilbur. Where do you start is the big question, but I want to make sure I mention something that doesn't get a lot of talk. There were about, it's related to anti-human trafficking. There were, I believe, about 10 bills uh, introduced in the session, and only two of them made it out of the first funnel. And many of these are related to uh, funding training and observation information in the schools. I think there was also one related to making sure uh, for some young folks that get sucked into prostitution that, they, uh, that they're, not, they're, they're left in the juvenile system but and the, not prosecuted the, as adults. The question was, what would you want to undo? What is your first thing okay. you want to undo? I, I, I realize that it's, it's just that uh, it's, not, it's not something that gets uh, spoken about, but uh, in terms of undoing something, it would be the privatization of Medicaid. You have all criticized the GOP tax plan that cleared the legislature recently. Mr. Hubble, what is your plan as the alternative? Well, uh, how long do we have? I mean, <laughs> they've less, less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there were time limits here, but they've created serious issues in our state. The fiscal mismanagement has been going on for for at least five years. We had a $900 million surplus in this state in 2013. That's gone. Now we, the, the governor owes $144 million to the reserve funds, which presumably in her budget gets paid back next year. But the budget also shows you know, $100 million of deficit, so we don't know what's gonna happen. First thing, first thing I wanna do about taxes is stop the wasteful tax giveaways for corporations and individuals. I was on a tax credit review panel in 2009 and 10 where we identified $160 million in annual savings. Let's go get that. Let's take that money, pay off the debt. Then we should take that what's left and put it in education and health care across our state so we can start investing in our future. At that point, you know, not, to be honest, we're going to be a year or two out. Then we need to take a look at where we are revenue-wise and fiscal-wise. How's the economy performing? This tax law that they created, unfortunately, probably won't give us that leeway because they've already identified $100 million of deficit coming in next year. So we're going to have to be making some other changes. Should it be repealed? I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to say that should be repealed yet, but what I am ready to say, let's attack the corporate tax giveaways. Let's take back the commercial property tax break. In their budget, they don't uh, maintain the backfill anymore, so that means it's not creating value, so we shouldn't continue that. They gave $30 million to the telecommunications company without getting anything in return. We should stop that. So that's $180 million plus $160. That's $340 million we can yeah, use. Let's hear from everybody. Mr. No on Mr. This. Norris, it absolutely what are needs to be repealed. There's no way it can sustain a $2 billion tax cut in this state. Well, we're underfunding education. We've got tremendous mental health needs. We've got a water quality problem to pick up, to fix up. And most of these tax cuts went to millionaires. They get a $25,000 tax cut. People making $25,000 a year get about an $18 tax cut. They're the ones we need to be helping. We've got too much poverty in this so, state. Mr. And there's Norris, a bigger shift in taxes. What taxes would you raise then? Pardon? You're just saying you're going to repeal that Republican yeah. uh, tax bill? That's your, that's your answer to that question. Yeah, that, that, yes, and we start over. I think the sales tax on internet sales was a good measure. Uh, certainly raising, we need to raise uh, the earned income tax credit and help those poor families in Iowa get ahead. Kathy Glossen. Yeah, I, I, the damage is done with this tax cut. It is clearly a Republican tax cut for the wealthy. Let's look at a family in Iowa or an individual making $40,000 a year. Uh, they'll see a tax savings under this uh, legislation of $92. Uh, that same family making a million dollars or the individual making a million dollars is going to see tax savings of nineteen. dollars thousand dollars so, clearly this is a tax cut for the wealthy so what would you do instead well we well what we need to do well, now we're going to have to find uh creative ways to get more revenue into the state to cover the things we care about because this tax bill uh is going to put iowa in a deficit for years to come and yeah. we aren't funding public education we're not funding health care we're not cleaning up our water uh so we absolutely need to do, do and i would take a look as governor i would want to talk about reshifting a different tax plan that's 
not regressive uh, and doesn't hurt folks at the lower income levels and has the more wealthy Iowans paying a little bit more. Mr. Bolton, what's your prescription? Well, first, obviously, I voted against this in the Senate this year, spoke out against it. I'm on the Appropriations Committee in the Iowa Senate, our Budget Committee. What we've seen is a fiscal nightmare in state government because of this administration's inability to deal responsibly with our tax system. At a time when our unemployment rate is low and the economy is stable and growing, we've seen raids of the rainy day funds and uh, emergency budget transfers, mid-year budget cuts and permanent budget cuts. And yet when they took up this bill, I put it out on the floor. Most people understand when you find yourself in a hole, you quit digging, yet they exploded. So the where hole. do you go to get new money? You come into office, your Absolutely. state's on, uh, running on fumes. Where right. do you go to get some new, what taxes do you raise? So it's about repealing some of the, the ex excessive corporate tax giveaways, the credits, the exemptions that are not yielding wage growth for our state. Uh, we're not seeing results for those investments of Iowa taxpayers' dollars. And I said Iowa taxpayer dollars because working families are paying for those giveaways. We're sending checks out of state, six and seven figure checks. So yes, we want to uh, cap some of those uh, and uh, credits and exemptions. We want to review that system. Uh, I introduced a bill that said we need transparency in this process. If we're going to give away something, voters need to see how many jobs we'll get from construction and how many jobs we'll get permanently. And I think we need a nominee that hasn't had a hand in the cookie jar on all this. Is there, who, which among these folks had their hand in the cookie well, jar? Well, we took a, take a look at some of the ex exemptions and giveaways that have happened. Uh, we've got uh, people here that have, have been willing to, to give away some of those things, as much as $250,000 per job in some projects. Who? who? Uh, Mr. Hubble was here. He, he was uh, director of economic development and uh, tried to entice a company uh, from, from out of state to to invest in a project. I think we have to have somebody that has not shown that they're willing to engage in this coupon economic system that is failing our state right now. Mr. Hubble? Well, your response? I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, he didn't name any particular project or location, but, but when, I was a, when I went into economic development, we had a film tax credit scan that was costing Iowans tens of millions of dollars. We fixed that. We saved our state millions of dollars, and we stopped giving away any state money to any project that did not have a prevailing wage requirement, which means that no money, no state money goes to any project where the company coming in or the company growing wasn't helping wages to grow in their community. Whereas today, what's going on with the Republicans in charge, they don't have that role, so they bring in jobs from out of state that are bring, bringing down the average pay. I need to be fair to Andy McGuire Good, let's and be Ralph Wilbur. <laughs> Well, tax policy. I, I don't think we have a revenue problem. I think we have a priority problem. You know, it, we've talked about these tax giveaways, and I think it is something we have to look at. You know, if I give you a dollar, if it's a good dollar, if it can give something back, a benefit to the taxpayer, that's great. But we've got a lot of these that are very, really almost corporate welfare, and we're giving it away. So I do think that's where you have to look, and then take that money and put it towards the priorities of people, which would be health care and education. So I do think that's how you, and I'm good at math, and I don't know how you do a budget where we've been cutting and doing mid-year cuts, and then we're going to not have as much revenue with the cut. It makes no sense to me math-wise. Russ Wilburn, where do you go to get new money? Repeal it, put a more progressive system in place, but I would also be you know, uh, revising uh, the corporate tax base, but also looking at even the outdoor recreation uh, uh, trust fund to try and pull some funding in that way. I want to go back to this uh, accusation you've made, Mr. <laughs> Bolton, against Fred Hubble. Yeah. What are you talking about? So we're talking about, you know, in economic development, uh, we've seen uh, an ongoing problem. It didn't start yesterday. It's been going on for years of overextending on these credits uh, as much as $250,000, $400,000, $500,000 per job. This administration said they were going to create well, No, I'm, I'm talking about Fred Hubble here. Right. So, so what did he do? What? So during so Chet Culver's administration. So right, right. It, <laughs> Paul cool. Musgrave was uh, on the, uh, ex the uh, head of the Economic Development Department. Uh, he gave out $29 million in tax credits over those four months. I think that's probably what Nate's referring to. Uh, you know, when, when, when Fred took it over, the, the, tax, the film tax credit had already been shut down. Uh, so he stepped in and helped clean it up. No doubt, he helped clean it up. I'll give you credit for that, absolutely. But then after four months, when Governor Vol Culver asked him to stay on, he said, no, he got frustrated because the legislative committees wouldn't do what he wanted to do, and so he didn't stay on and quit. So four months' experience in DED is hardly a lifetime. Well, what about that, Mr. Hubble? Well, neither of these gentlemen were there at the time. He wasn't even in the, country, in the state. He was living out of state, and he was, I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't anywhere close to the legislature. So, 
So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what really was going on. What was going on is we had a scandal that if you talk to the Attorney General's office, the potential, the potential harm to our state was in the hundreds of millions of dollars when I went in there. And it, correct you, John, it was not stopped then. We stopped it because we couldn't stop it before. I had to work with the Attorney General and figure out which, how do you stop it? Because we had claims coming from all over the place. I was referring to the CIA because so, so we had, we had, to, we had to go in and stop there, some, right? and we had to support some, and we had to bring lawsuits against some. One at a time, please. Kathy Nobody Glossen. here is talk, answering your question. We need to raise the minimum wage to $15 <laughs> an hour and bring in tax revenue uh, and create good jobs that are union jobs in this state. Uh, they can bicker all they want about what they did or didn't do, but Iowans need a raise. We have 381,000 households in this state that can't make ends meet because our wages are too low. So to answer the question to create revenue, and there are other ways to do that besides just rolling back tax credits. So uh, we, Iowans need to know what the options are, and we need to clearly they, lay them out instead of bickering amongst each other on a tax credit here, a tax credit there. James. Back in uh, back in 2010, Iowa voters said they supported a three eighths cents sales tax for water quality and outdoor recreation, uh, but they didn't vote to levy it. So, Russ Wil Ross Wilburn, you brought this up. Will you lead an effort to pass a sales tax increase for water quality, and how will you get lawmakers, including Democratic legislators, to vote for a tax hike? Yes, I would. Uh, about 63 percent of Iowans, uh, you know, said let's do it. And it can't, a sales tax can be regressive. There's some other things, maybe through earned income tax, we can try and balance, mitigate the effect on lower income Iowans. But uh, let me tell you, I've got relatives who live in Flint, Michigan, and I bet you they'd pay three-eighths of a penny to have clean water to this day. Is it, is it fair to say all of you would support raising that uh, sales tax of three-eighths of, of a penny? No. Anybody disagree with that? Yeah. You would disagree I disagree with, with that. Yeah, right. and I've been clear Why? about that. Well, here's what I, uh, here's... Where do you go to get money to clean up the environment? A whole corporate, corporate agribusness, the complex of industry that's taken over our, our agricultural land in this state. And uh, how do you do that? Hold them accountable for but the how pollution. How do you do that? I mean, a tax, uh, a criminal nitrogen, penalty? Nitrogen, liquid nitrogen tax, maybe increase the fertilizer tax that we're putting on swaths of corn and soybeans in this state, and then stricter fines and penalties for the confined animal feeding operations when they pollute our waterways. It's not small family farmers I'm talking about or independent. These are the corporate agribusness that have, uh, w have really ta overrun our state, and we've lost independent family farming, and we need to bring that back again. But I, can I just add one thing about what we were talking talking about over here, um, is that so one of my opponents down the row here uh, talked about how the economy is good and unemployment is low. That is not the case. Again, we have 381,000 households struggling to pay their bills each month. You know, the, the unemployment rate may be low in this state, but the misery index of families is high. And I just think we need to be really clear about uh, what the real uh, economic situation in the state of Iowa is, and it's caused by uh, Republican tax cuts and underfunding the things we care about. And McGuire, what about the three-eighths cent? It, you, you have to listen to the people. The people said, 63% of them said they wanted it. You have to listen to the people. But what I hear all the time is it's not even just about that revenue coming in, that revenue source. We need to get people all around the table. We need to stop demonizing certain people as having done this problem. This is all of our problem. We need to know where we are and as a scientist where we need to go. We need to get everybody at the table and have <laughs> metrics and accountability. But that 3 8 cents tax is, is absolutely imperative to get this done. Anybody else want to weigh in? I, I would. I, first, I'd point out that I've taken action on this, not just talking points, but actually introduced legislation. It had co-sponsors, including uh, several of my Democratic colleagues, as well as our one independent in the Iowa Senate, to actually get this done. I mean, voters asked for it by over 60% of the vote. We need to do something that has a long-term, sustainable solution on water okay. quality. Ross Wilmer. Two other pieces to that. The sales uh, tax penny would also, you know, there are groups out there like the Borough Trust Land Trust, these land trusts that are waiting to match funds to try and recapture some of that. The second piece that I would add to that is that environmental issues are not new to me. As mayor, I signed the 2007 U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. We put real tangible pieces into place, um, you know, preserving a, a, a former sand quarry to make it a, a public amenity and conservation recycling center. And so it, you need to think more broad than just the taxes, what you can leverage. Mr. Hubble? Well, actually, in 2009 and 2010, my wife and I were very much active in the Ira Water and Land Legacy, which was the group that put together the whole uh, Natural Outdoor Resources Trust Fund you're talking about. We actually worked on the actual legislation itself that ultimately went to the voters in 2010. 
and we've worked on it every year since. I've been meeting with legislators, Republicans and Democrats, every year since then. You know what they all say? We think the voters already approved it, but we're just not going to, it's going to come back sometime. We're just not ready for it John yet. John North? This is all good about finding 3A cents, but we got a bigger issue to deal with in agriculture and the resulting in water quality is we have to change the culture and practice of farming in this state. We've been doing high input, high output, no profit agriculture for too long. We have to be the state that sets the vision for the change in agriculture in this country and quite frankly across the globe and target low input and low energy and low emissions agriculture and high profitability. So and that's what we've got to change. So then do you regulate farming? No, you've got to, you know, we, we eliminated the funding for the Leopold Center, which is, which is the limited amount of public research we were doing to help farmers realize how to farm more profitably and sustainably. We have to change that culture to increase profitability for farming. How do you and they'll see the, the benefit in rebuilding soil health and clean up our water supply. Mr. Whether Hubble. you raise the 3A cents or hold corporate agriculture accountable or change the culture, how do you do it as governor, Mr. Hubble? How do you make that change happen? There's, there's a couple things you have to do. First of all, it's going to take a bipartisan vote. And that means we need to bring Iowans into the picture. We need to get Iowans to recognize it's an Iowa problem. It's not an us, them, or ag, urban. We all have to come together. Because what's going to happen is we're going to, when you invest in the nutrient reduction strategy, which is what's outlined in, the, in that uh, Natural Outdoor Resources Trust Fund, what you do is you actually protect water quality and you preserve the topsoil. We're losing five tons per acre topsoil every year in this state. You know, so just think how that's going to compound over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Okay. There's not going to be hardly any topsoil. So it's very important that we invest in that so we have permanent, protected money that goes to preserve topsoil and protect the water. Mr. Bolton, as you well know, when the Des Moines Water Works sued three northwest Iowa counties about how they managed um, drainage issues in their area, it offended a lot of farmers. How would you bridge this gap between rural Iowa and urban Iowa and resolve this issue in a bipartisan way? Well, the reality is we're going to see more and more desperate ma measures as inaction continues on this core issue. And while Governor Reynolds said in her condition of the state address she was going to sign as her first bill a monumental water quality bill, what did we get? Not even a new bill. The leftovers from the last session that didn't survive because it didn't do enough, because it was expensive without actually unimpairing waterways or leading to, to monitoring or changing watersheds. Uh, and I think one of the things we can do is reframe this. Not only is this about water quality and land management, it's about economic opportunity. I'm very proud of the work my wife Andrea does as the trails director of a conservation nonprofit. We can bring people to Iowa to enjoy our natural resources if they don't see toxic bacteria level we're, signs at our public beaches. We're almost at the midpoint in the debate and I want to move on to, to another segment in our questioning. And I'll start with you, Mr. Hubble. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that Republicans are going to use against each one of you should you be the nominee. Okay? I don't think I have anything to use, right? Uh, well, no, but the, the point is this is a primary. It's about electability. Uh, let's, let's get this uh, linen out here on the table and, and, and talk about it. Mr. Hubble, you're rich. You're from Des Moines. You're a liberal. You've never run for office before. Now, and you may be trying to buy this primary with all your TV ads. Now, how do you respond to those attacks that are going to come against you, at least from Republicans and maybe from some of these other Democrats here? Well, my campaign from the very beginning has been focused on winning the general election because that's the only thing that really matters for Democrats. We need to win the general election. So from the very beginning, we've started to travel all across our state. I've been to all the counties, and I go out and sit down and, and meet people in their own turf, in their offices, on their farms, coffee shops, the houses, and listen and learn and share ideas. A man in Independence, Iowa, told me that he hasn't seen any personal income growth in that community for five or six years. A woman in Old Wine told me that when she opens up the school books, because she's a teacher, pages fall out, and sometimes they're missing 10 or 15 pages at a time. You know, that's the stories you hear about what's going on in Iowa. So what I've done is I've listened to Iowans, and I've, I've recognized that they have three key issues. They want better education, and they know that this, this Republican governor and legislature are just squeezing them. They want to have uh, better health care, whether it's supporting Planned Parenthood or doing something finally on mental health or reversing the privatization of Medicaid, air and water quality, and they want incomes to go up. And this, this legislature and this governor are not making progress in any of those. James. So Mr. when they, when they, when they find out that what I'm talking about is, is their issues, and then I tell them what I've done in my life, 
you know, whether it's, what I said at the very beginning, actually getting results in the public and the private sector and spending a good time, a good part of my career fixing crises in our state as well as volunteering to support the progressive values and the quality of life that make this state a wonderful place. James. M Mr. Bolton, the knock on you is you're too young, you're too inexperienced, and you're too tightly connected to labor unions. What's your defense? I love this airing of grievances part of the debate now. Um, <laughs> no, w when we start talking about some of those things that, that you're mentioning as liabilities, I think Iowans are ready for a new generation of leadership. Iowans are tired of seeing this administration planning for the next six to 24 months and having no vision for Iowa for the next six to 24 years. I think in terms of our working families in this state, I'm proud to have the support of the Iowa Federation of Labor and several labor unions that represent over 250,000 Iowa workers who want to see a better path forward. I'm proud of the work I've done for 12 years as a workers rights attorney, standing up for people who have been mistreated by their employers, who have been cast aside. I'm proud of the work that I've done in the Iowa Senate to, to promote an agenda that actually restores value to working families in this state, and I'm looking forward to doing that as governor. Okay. Ms. Glosson, if you're the party's nominee in the general election, one could envision an ad from Republicans where your face morphs into Bernie Sanders and they attack <laughs> universal health care and uh, your, your deep union roots. What would be your response to Republicans in, on those tactics? Well, I've already been attacked by the RGA. They have, a, they have a website against me, and I'm proud of that because you know what? They're saying universal single payer. All Iowans having health care, uh, union uh, leader, union boss, raising wages and improving working, uh, working conditions for Iowa workers, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, outrageous. Uh, I'm proud of those. And, uh, you know, we need are you, both... Excuse me, are you too liberal to win a general no, election? No, no, and you know why? Let me tell you why. I'm not too liberal because look at what just happened in the primaries across this country uh, yesterday. Bold, progressive women candidates winning. And that's what we need in Iowa, is a vision moving us forward, not status quo politics and policies as usual. Uh, and that's why our campaign is different, because we're a people-powered organization, not stuck on me as the candidate, but focused on the issues that will improve the lives of over a million Iowans. James. Ms. McGuire, uh, on your watch, the Democratic Party had some caucus night bumps and in the November election suffered defeat at the polls. Should Iowans t trust you to get this job done? You know, when I go all over Iowa, I'm proud of the county chairs and the activists. I see that we all worked our hearts out on that election, but when a national wave comes over the top of you and takes out Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania, you really have something that's hard to control from a local. What I will tell you I hear, though, I hear people who are upset with what's happened the last two years in the Republican legislature and under the Branstead Reynolds, now Reynolds administration. I hear about stripping collective bargaining from public service uh, employees and from teachers. I hear about these women's uh, rights that have really been taken away. I hear about work comp. I hear about this voter f uh, bill that really limits our voting. I hear about underfunding education, which is how all of us become successful. I hear a very unified voice out there. So I think I'm the one, because of some of the deep issues, I'm ex 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 uniquely qualified. But I think James's question went to, the, given the problems you had in the party, why should Democrats think that you can be the person to solve those problems? Well, I'm yeah. not sure those were as local problems as they were a national problem. We did a lot of good in that party. We um, got 99 county chairs where there weren't. We have a lot of infrastructure that we did, and I think that will pay off in the long run. We were financially stable. So I think there's a lot of things we did well, and I will tell you, um, you can ask the other people, but I know where I was all the time when we were trying to elect people in Iowa. I was working hard. Mr. Norris, you've been a mechanic You've worked in the office and on the campaigns for people like Tom Vilsack, Tom Harkin, Leonard Boswell, Jesse Jackson, yet you have never won elected office and people have been a bit surprised given your connections that you haven't raised as much money for this primary campaign as you might have otherwise done. How will you reassure Democrats that if you are the party's nominee that you will be an aggressive fundraiser and the best candidate to face off against a very well-funded Kim Reynolds? Well, don't confuse primary fundraising prowess with general election fundraising prowess. In fact, Fred told me before we either one of us got in that I couldn't win because he's going to have all the money. Uh, honest story. <laughs> in Democratic primary politics, in Democratic primary politics, there are two big sources of money. It's Fred's social circle south of Grand in Des Moines that write $100,000 checks. 
And it's labor money that was on board with Nate before he even got in the race and SEIU from Kathy. But all of those people have told me, if you win this primary, we'll be behind you 100% in the general. So I'm running this gauntlet right now with few resources, uh, but winning support with ideas and a vision for the future of Iowa and wearing my car out while I'm at it. Uh, and that's what it's going to take to win the general election is who can bring everyone together in the end. Mr. Hubble, you want to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would just say, from the, as I said before, from the very beginning, we, we started a campaign to win the general election. So we've actually been, we, we have proven we have support in every county and we had over 2,000 contributors in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the December 31 filing, and we have more since then. I don't think all of those live south of Grand in my district. James? Mr. Wilburn, yes. uh, you've been characterized as a university town liberal. Uh, how do you connect with rural and blue-collar Iowa voters? Uh, there's two parts to that. Uh, one, I would suggest if you talk to folks in Johnson County or Iowa City, um, uh, what do they call it, the Democratic Socialist Republic of Iowa? Um, <laughs> There will people, be people who say Ross was uh, not progressive enough, and there's people who say he was too liberal. And um, you know, we took strides to put things in place that progress has happened in, in the community. I think secondly, um, just not only working at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and being out in Orange City and Sutherland or Maquoketa, uh, you know, all, all areas there. I mean, I went to a, uh, during Nitrogen Week, I went to Sutherland on a cover crop uh, workshop and what I hear from rural Iowans, they're concerned about water. They're concerned about making a living. They're concerned about living in their communities. That cuts across uh, urban, rural, uh, race, gender, gender identity, all of those areas. And so um, I would say, having served on a city council, which is nonpartisan, but everyone knows who the Democrats, Republicans, and Socialists and Greens are, um, that just the fact that I was able to become uh, mayor and get some things done on that city is a sign to the public, I think. Candidates, let's talk some specifics about the health care issue. Uh, Ms. Glosson, legislators this past uh, month set aside $1.3 billion to provide Medicaid coverage to about 600,000 Iowans. How would you pay to provide universal health care, which if you kind of do the math, would be at least $6 billion if you cover every Iowan with universal health care? Yeah, so, you know, the important fact is that we've got to work on the plan and transition to it. It's not going to happen overnight. We know that. Uh, we do need to reverse, uh, and it will transition after we re, uh, reverse privatized Medicaid. Um, and what we do is, in the price tag, uh, we've got the plan and we're working on the price tag. And I'm working with uh, uh, national organizations and policymakers that are looking at this in other states as well. So Iowa is not the only state considering this because the current system under the private insurance market is unsustainable and Iowans are feeling that in higher co-pays and premiums and out-of-pocket costs. So we pay for this in the concept of uh, rolling back tax credits, unnecessary ta tax credits for wealthy corporations operations, and that goes into the pot to cover Iowans health care. How much is that? Uh, well, we, if you t total all, all the tax credits run about $400, $600 million a year, but some of those are good. So we need a thorough investigation. As governor, I will call for a thorough investigation of all the tax credits and incentives we're giving and make sure that we weed out the ones that are not improving the, the t and that we get that, that taxpayers aren't getting what they uh, are, are paying for, right? Do you have to raise taxes to pay for it? No, I don't think so. And let, let me finish. So uh, we uh, d draw down every federal dollar from Medicare and Medicaid because we know Donald Trump is willing to do that. He's, uh, we know that the federal government's willing to let states run their own plans and coverage. So, and then we actually take employers who currently cover most uh, insurance of uh, people in Iowa at work and have the employers pay into that pool as well. We raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. That brings in more tax revenue to help fund universal single payer health care. Uh, and then if we get the private insurance companies out of our health care, because we know that the only thing they care about is making a profit and not actually taking care of Iowans health. And so we know that we can vastly reduce the cost of health care for Iowans over the private system that we're in now. I think it's fair to say that none of you like the privatized management of Medicaid, but the reason the state shifted away from that was because the cost was gobbling up the state budget. So where do we go from here? What's the solution to getting transitioning away from privatized management? How do we get there, and what's it going to cost for us? And let's start with you, Mr. Hubble. 
Well, the privatization of Medicaid has been an absolute failure. I mean, we have 40,000 Iowans who are not getting there. I, I think everyone up here agrees on that. Where well, do we go but, from but here? But the point is, we don't know what it cost before. We don't know what it's costing now. They haven't even negotiated the contracts. They were supposed to negotiate in January. They're not done. So nobody knows because they're not sharing that information. You know, so it's hard to tell how expensive it is and where the money's going because they don't want people to know. They're, there's no transparency. But what I want to do is bring it back in under state management because state employees were, were costing us 4 to 5 percent before. Now we're paying 12 to 15. So, you know, that's not a good trade right there. And, and if you look around, there are many, many states that have moved in this direction. There's no states that have gone to just a, hardly any, that have gone to a pure MCO approach because Medicaid is not just one, just one person's the same. I mean, there's a lot of different buckets in Medicaid, and you can't treat them all the same. So what a lot of other states are doing is they're treating, they're treating different people who are in the Medicaid system differently, a more customized approach. That allows you to actually save money. You give, rather than pushing people into institutions, which are very expensive, you do more home-based treatment. People who are le less intensive in their needs, you work on more prevention and help up front so they don't have as many health needs. Andy but we're McGuire. not doing that in our state. Andy McGuire? Well, and, and you can see from that discussion, this is very complicated, and that's why I think I'm uniquely qualified to, to fix this situation. So what you have to do right now, and I, I wish you didn't, but this is unstable right now. You have patients who are at risk. So you have to bring this back into the state. You know, as a doctor, I took an oath to keep patients first. I'll always put people first. So we take patients first. We also aren't paying providers. And a lot of these are small business owners, physical therapy, home health, our rural hospitals, which 20 to 30 of our rural hospitals are at risk because of the non-payment. So you have to make sure you bring it back into the state and you have to do that with the people on the ground so that you talk to people and say, how do we bring this back so we don't do what they did, which was four months, they reversed the whole thing. We've gotta be careful how we bring it back. And then once we bring it back in, then you have to start saying, how can we keep people healthier? How can we invest in their health? I, uh, when I was with our company, we doubled prenatal care. We doubled uh, immunizations. It's that kind of preventive care that you invest in people's health. It helps them get out of the circle of poverty. It also, long term, will steady that, that um, amount of money we spend that you're talking about. I want to hear from some other candidates. Mr. Norris? Yeah, I don't disagree with what Fred and Andy just said. We, it's been mismanaged. The misery they had on this was not recognizing low incomes in the state and our increasing elderly population. We're going to have a Medicaid <laughs> issue until we start getting people off eligibility for Medicaid. You know, had, had we done what Branson and Reynolds promised, raise incomes 25 percent, we'd have less people on Medicaid. Uh, we have a growing age population and that's going to be an issue we got, have to deal with not just Medicaid but increasing our direct care workforce. So the misread on this was thinking they could save money by enabling insurance companies to make a, a big profit off the Medicaid pool money as opposed to working to invest in education and mental health care and raising wages in the state and getting people off of Medicaid in general. And Mr. Bolton? This administration skipped some pretty key steps uh, involving providers in the discussion, involving the disability community. When we've seen the most harsh effects of privatized, out-of-state, managed care organizations dictating to Iowans what care they can and cannot get and denying and delaying claims, the reality is we have to make sure that those with the most severe medical needs, long-term disabilities, are taken care of. And I offered legislation that would have immediately stripped out th those most severe needs. And then we have to get back to uh, the, the legislation I co-sponsored for a six-month transition, get us back to, to square one with fee-for-service, and then figure out the long-term solutions by actually bringing people together, not a go-it-alone solution, hoping it works out in the end. The bottom line is we're going to pay for health care uh, one way or the other. We can do it the preventative way uh, or we can do it the reactive way and allow uh, for profits to make money off it. As Democrats, we know we believe in individual responsibility, but we have a collective obligation to each other. Let's be Iowa and, and reverse this privatization of Medicaid. Uh, Ms. McGuire, another health issue, medical marijuana. <laughs> Doctors are reluctant to recommend it as treatment because it, under the federal law, it's still a controlled substance. How do you resolve that without action at the federal level? Well, I think you have to do something with the state to make it more like a regular drug. 
And I think you can do that with the state. I, you know, it's hard to know what the federal government's going to do, especially with the present leadership. But in the state, you can treat this like any other drug. And you should never take anything out of that pipeline because tomorrow there could be another use for that drug. And that's why we have the rule of pharmacy so that once a drug is approved and it comes in, you could say that it's going to be treated like any other drug. Then doctors and patients can make those decisions. So that's how it ought to be treated. Mr. Wilburn, college town man, mm -hmm. um, there are people who say if if you allow uh, medical marijuana for any condition, that that is essentially recreational marijuana. Is that something that you are concerned about, or do you think that more conditions should be allowed um, to uh, seek medical marijuana as treatment? I think more conditions sh should be allowed. I think that's an overreaction for folks saying that it's, it's a direct line to recreational use. There are people who are hurting now. My mother died of cancer in 1985 when I was 20. She could have certainly benefited from uh, you know, uh, medical marijuana. My father died of Alzheimer's. I remember uh, the, the nurses saying, uh, in this case, they didn't know why the doctor uh, wasn't providing an, an opioid because he was hurting for, for the last two weeks. He's someone who could have, could have benefited. Re reduce the schedule. Um, let's put this let's put this in place to take care of Iowans now. Kathy Glossen. Medical cannabis actually is used to treat opioid addiction. So evidence is showing that it's actually beneficial in keeping off a, as a gateway drug. So just to be clear, we need to look at the evidence here. Medical cannabis has been very effective in treating lots of ailments, very serious ones, uh, you know, de even depression and severe seizure disorders, uh, those, those sort of really hard me uh, medical conditions. So does the legislature decide which conditions it should cover, or should a professional board decide that? Well, I think, the, I think we need the, uh, the uh, professional, uh, the medical professionals should be helping address it, uh, but we need to make it more accessible, which it isn't right now. Um, and so the state of Iowa should actually work a little bit harder. Uh, I know it was passed on bipartisan effort. Uh, I think we need to expand it, make it more readily available to folks because they are suffering now. And in some instances, the medical conditions are so severe, what we're offering uh, Iowans right now uh, is not strong enough to actually uh, help them with Let's their condition. The the Mr. Hubble, uh, five dispensaries will be around the state to um, allow access to the drug uh, later this year, actually very late this year in December. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. If we're, if we're really committed to quality, affordable health care for all Iowans, which is, we should be, and it's certainly a big part of my campaign, uh, the science is clear that there are a lot more forms of, of medical illnesses and medical issues that, me that medical marijuana can actually be very beneficial for much broader than what we allow in our state. Other states have gone a lot broader than we have. So we should not only increase that with the advice of the medical community, but we should also allow more kinds of, of, uh, of marijuana itself. There's a lot of different uh, levels of, of THC that can be used. We have one of the lowest, and it's, and it's been proven that different kinds of THC are, are better or worse with different kinds of illnesses. So we need to expand on both sides. Mr. Don, Norris? This is the case where the governor's not leading when she needs to. Uh, people are suffering in this state She's spending all her political capital on tax cuts for millionaires. As our governor, I would spend some political capital on educating Iowans about how this helps people. Let's get over this paranoia with the recreational drug and get this fixed for people who need it. Mr. Bolton? Yeah, I, I've, I've sponsored legislation to expand the use uh, of medical cannabis. Uh, and the reality is we're not going to get more providers coming into our state uh, to, to invest in a medical cannabis solution if we don't have more accessibility. We're not going to get people that are going to come here to only be able to, to offer to a small number of, of Iowans. What we should do, the legislature should be involved, but it should be to expressly authorize medical professionals to make the decisions that Andy they need McGuire, to. you had something you wanted to well, add. This shouldn't be a discussion we're having with the governors. That's the problem here. This should be a discussion that doctors looking at scientific medical literature ought to be making those decisions. This is the problem. You don't want to have the legislature. You don't want to have the governor involved in this. You want to have it done by physicians with their patients. And to your point of abuse, I understand that, but we have a lot of drugs that are abused and we don't stop having them. Let's look at the abuse rather than looking at why we wouldn't use it for good purposes. I need to move on to another question. James? There have been several references to the fetal heartbeat bill that the legislature passed and the governor signed into law recently. A couple of strategies in dealing with that. One, the legislature should repeal it. Two, let the courts decide. Who's for repeal? Who's for uh, letting the courts decide? How, how many want to repeal it? Everybody wants to repeal it. <laughs> okay. It's, 
it's likely that the courts will put it on hold while there's a, it's in the court. Why not just let the court decide? Mr. Bolton. Well, I mean, I pointed this out at 1.30 in the morning when we were debating this bill, which, by the way, bad legislation is made after, after midnight. <laughs> When we start talking about the faults of this legislation, I was there asking hard questions of the floor manager of the bill, and he kept telling me, well, I don't know the consequence of that. I don't know the consequence of that. We can't be having legislation come through, get signed by the governor, without fully understanding exactly what it means. And in this case, it meant threatening a woman's right to choose, making Iowa the most extreme anti-choice state in the nation, and actually threatening to worsen our crisis in the state of not having enough OBGYN care providers for, for Iowa women. Andy McGuire, uh, this is probably going to end up in the courts regardless of what the legislature does, so why not just let the courts handle it? Because it's wrong. This was the wrong law. This is hurting women. And if, I'm, I appreciate that the courts will probably find this un unconstitutional, but it was the wrong thing to do for women. It sends the wrong signal, and it can hurt women. This won't decrease abortions. This will hurt women. It gets between a woman and her doctor on a very Mr. important Wilmer. issue. Those points are absolutely right. And regardless of your feelings about abortion, uh, ending up in litigation and the tax dollars that will go towards that, I understand there's a firm out of Chicago that's volunteering to uh, defend, defend this, but now we've got out-of-state uh, folks that are going to jump in and, and follow the money on that. Brett Hubble? Yeah, I think what it comes down to, do we want Iowa to be known in the national news as a state that defunded Planned Parenthood and has the most extreme anti-women's health care law in the country? Or do we want Iowa to be known as a state that has an excellent health care system, including mental health? That's what we should be aspiring for. This bill sends all the wrong messages. The sooner we can get rid of it, the better. John Norris? Let's, let's say the one, two, three million dollars we're going to do defending this, get rid of it, and put that money into Planned Parenthood. Kathy Glossa. I just want to respond to something uh, one of my uh, opponents just said, uh, who speaks out about uh, standing up against, uh, uh, you know, fighting this bad fetal heartbeat bill, um, when there's actually been money given to candidates in, in the state legislature that actually voted for this bill. Uh, I want to be clear that if you're up here talking about women's reproductive health and safe legal abortions, you better be walking the walk and not talking the talk. Uh, and so this is a terrible bill. It is unconstitutional. Uh, the problem with it going through the courts is that it's going to challenge Roe versus Wade on the national level, and that's what the hope is. Who are you talking about? I'm challenging Mr. Hubble. Uh, who has contributed to campaigns at state legislature that actually voted for the fetal heartbeat bill. Mr. Hubble. She's talking about Peter County, who's a state legislator. That's right. Charlotte and I have known the counties for over 30 years, ever since Peter County was a young boy. It's a very close, strong family relationship. So when we had an opportunity to support Peter, of course we did. Did I like his vote? No. Did I like the vote of anybody else who voted for it? No. If I had been governor, would I have vetoed it? Yes. But I don't, I don't look at everything in a strictly partisan lens. When you have a close family relationship, those are important. And, and by the way, if we're going to win this election and we're going to get anything accomplished when, when one of us is governor, we're going to have to reach out to the Trump voters and all the voters all across this state because we're going to need them to help us win the election and we're going to need them to govern. I want to raise... Oh. I want to... Uh, I want to change subjects, and I want to move to, uh, and Mr. Wilburn, I'll start with you. Um, issue, and this involves the use of the governorship as a moral leader to deal with problems. How do you deal, you, how will you address, say, sexual harassment, anti-gay biases in our state, uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric that we've heard in this state? How would you use the moral bully pulpit of the governorship to deal with those problems? By starting with Iowa's history, Iowans welcomed folks from Southeast Asia here uh, in the state. Now their children in the 1970s, their children, their grandchildren, they're contributing parts of this state. They're all types of first at, at the college towns of, uh, you know, first African Americans, first women, first Latino, et cetera, uh, in professions around uh, the state. So uh, in terms of sexual harassment, I would make sure that staff know and the state knows that the freedom to not be sexually harassed is a civil right. It's not just a question of morality. It's a civil right. There's a process in place, investigation, 
and penalties for those who are violators, as well as an educational piece. I did it when I was a um, uh, diversity officer for the Iowa City Community School District. I conducted those investigations. I made sure there was education and, and put that out there. So, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the LGBTQ plus community, the governor actually going to uh, the youth summit, uh, the youth uh, leadership summit, and, and those type of symbolic things that can be put in place. But also, you know, there's, there's executive orders that, that can be done. We can, uh, you know, it, in some ways it's symbolic, but Iowa is a um, uh, English only. Now, it's governmental documents, but that sends a negative message. And that's not, that's not what we want to do here I'd like in everyone Iowa. to weigh in quickly. Andy McGuire. Well, I've felt the sting of sexual harassment and what Kim Reynolds did when this is a culture that's been going on and there's been very little significant changes. You have to stand up and say, this will not be tolerated anywhere. It will not only not be tolerated, it won't be tolerated if you saw it and didn't do anything to help that person. And it's not just women. This is anyone who's devalued. That's what we're doing right now. And it takes somebody at the top to say, I value everybody, I value their work, and I want them to be productive. The other thing we talk about a lot with LGBTQ that I think you could do as the governor is you could support that we ban conversion therapy. That's something that's really a, a black mark on our state, and we should do that. And with the immigration, we need people who don't necessarily look like, like I look. I need, we need in Iowa more people like that. They're just trying to do exactly what we all want to do, which is raise their families and work hard and be good citizens. We need to welcome that, them instead of this, this really, we're close for business sign that's up for immigration right now. Senator Bolton. I'm someone who, as a worker's rights attorney, has represented victims of sexual harassment, discrimination based on gender uh, in the workplace. And I think what we ought to be doing in state government is leading by the right example, not the negative example. I've co-sponsored legislation that would make sure that it's not just taxpayers who are accountable for verdicts that come But is come there anything in. you would do with the governorship itself as a moral leader besides sure. introducing and one of those things is, is making sure we actually have equal pay for equal work in state government. We have far too much of a wage disparity for women in state government. We're not going to eliminate sexual harassment and discrimination if women aren't treated as equals in the workplace from the beginning. Mr. Hubble? Well, it starts with leadership. And it starts with demonstrating that leadership. If you look at my campaign, the people that are working on my campaign, we have by far the most diverse campaign team out there. Very diverse, and they all do excellent work. So what would I do as governor? The same thing. If you want to send the right message, you got to lead by example. So the people that are going to work for me and, and when I'm governor are going to be a complete diverse mix of people representing all the different folks across our state. Because that's what you need to do. If you don't hire those people, you don't put them in leadership positions, then nobody else will realize that they can move up, that they have opportunities. Mr. North. Well, I'm proud when I was Governor Bill Sachs Chief of Staff that nearly all the women on that staff are supporting me in this campaign. Uh, so that gives me uh, uh, just a great deal of pride because they respect how I treated them. You want to fix this problem? Put women in charge. Okay. <laughs> Kathy, go on. Well, you're, you're talking about multiple issues, so I'll try, yes. to, be, I'll try to be succinct here. Um, as far as the uh, Governor Reynolds' handling of the, uh, of the sexual harassment and misconduct, she failed to deal with this. It's been mismanaged from the start, <coughs> and that's clear from her entire administration is really fraught with uh, sexual harassment and misconduct. We need a leader that when they say zero tolerance, they mean zero tolerance, and that means our swift investigation by a third independent outside party to address it. I don't believe the state of Iowa should be monitoring itself when it comes to extremely important issues like this. And we do need more women in leadership, whether it's in business or government, that have the guts to stand up and do what the right thing to do is. And we have to thank the Me Too movement. Um, I'm a woman in a mo mostly male-dominant labor movement in the state of Iowa. So I understand that there are brave women that stuck their necks out here and have raised this level of awareness so that, it, it, so that we can actually address it appropriately. And it does speak to our minorities and LGBTQ plus communities where we need to make sure that their civil liberties are protected because right now they're not with this sort of administration and James? our uh, president. The, the United States Supreme Court recently uh, opened the door for sports betting, legalized sports betting uh, with a, its decision. Um, first, anyone opposed to that, the state of Iowa do, offering legalized sports betting? Well, I wanna add, I want okay. to why? Uh, a caveat. What, what's your I, I'm not opposed. I just I, I want to look at it. I, I want to understand a little bit more. I want to see what the what the actual legislation might look like. 
you know, I, well, you know, I'd consider it, but I'd want to make sure that any yeah. revenue generated from it, we actually set aside for public education. Is anybody? Ross yeah, Ross not Wilbur. outright opposed. You're outright. There, what's that? Are you outright opposed to it? I'm not outright opposed to it. Is anybody it, no. outright opposed to it? I need more information. Okay, uh, let's, I, I, let's, I, I, let's, let's, that, let's let everybody but have but a, a but few yeah. Ross Wilburn, yeah. go ahead. We'll, we'll go right down the line. We'll talk about sports betting. I think, as with anything, you have to be careful on how it's implemented. That's, that's I think, what, what part of the concern uh, that you hear up here is. But um, with the, uh, you know, the lottery board, it, it putting some things in place, like making sure that there is, uh, for any, uh, you know, gambles or anonymous, those type of things. But there, there is sports betting that is going on in the state right now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's internet, uh, you know, it, so it, it's going on right now. So mm -hmm. I think a way to, to put some controls on it uh, uh, in some, some ways similar to medical marijuana, uh, regulate it, legislate it, that type of thing. I think you have to make sure you don't have any unintended consequences, and I think that's what you're hearing up here. And you have to make sure that the revenues, that the state gets some revenues from this so that we can handle some of the priorities we've been talking about tonight. And then you have to make sure that there's community betterment like there is now with the casinos. So I've taught sport law at Simpson College for years, and this is something that's not a new issue to me. As we look at what could happen with our state, we want to make sure, yes, I, I think we ought, we ought to support uh, sports gambling, but we want to make sure we preserve the integrity of our student athletes, uh, our athletes at Iowa, Iowa State, Drake, and you and I in particular, uh, that could be victimized if we don't do everything possible to keep integrity in, in sports and, and uh, in our college athletes. Mr. Hubble? I think this is like a lot of issues that uh, it, it might be a nice idea, but we really need to study it first and see what the bill does. We need to protect minors. We need to, who's going to get the revenue? How are you going to divide the revenue up? And, and you know, are you going to, what are you going to do for the college athletes that Nate is referring to? Because if we're going to let betters make money on it, you know the, the leagues are going to make more money. The only one left out is the student athletes. John North. Yeah, the reason I want more information is I'm skeptical of any gambling. It's a poor people's tax, leads to bankruptcy, leads to broken families. So I've got to be convinced that this can be managed appropriately and actually will reduce that. If there's enough under the table gambling going on that's happening anyway, then maybe we legalize it. But the first approach is be skeptical because gambling in general hurts our, hurts our low-income Iowans worse. Um, looking for a succinct answer. We haven't much time left. So I'll start with you, Mr. Norris. What is Kim Reynolds' Achilles heel? Total. <laughs> succinct, please. Yeah, see, total mismanagement of government. Uh, Mr. Hubble? Lack of leadership. Mr. It is leadership. We went through a whole legislative session waiting for action from her. We didn't see her lead, and uh, we were even wondering what she was going to sign at the end of session. So it's leadership. You were in doubt that she would sign some of those pieces? That was the question. A lot of people said, it was this too extreme for her? Because she didn't step up and actually engage herself in the legislative process. There should be no doubt with a bill that, of that magnitude as to what the governor's position is. Ms. What I hear from Iowans is they think she doesn't care, that she's not a leader who cares about every Iowan success, that she's only really concerned with a small portion of Iowa being successful, and I think that's her Achilles heel. Mr. Wilburn? Leadership and the courage to act against her funders. Untrustworthy. We can't trust anything she says. She set, puts window dressing on everything that's been passed this legislative session. There's no money to fund anything that she said. That's what Iowans need to understand about Kim Reynolds. James. This year, uh, during the legislative session, despite very high profile shootings, we didn't see a lot of action on any gun related um, legislation. Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Bolton. What gun restrictions would you support and sign into law if the legislature sent it to you? So uh, I've opposed some of the egregious things that have happened recently in the legislature. Expanding the use of deadly force to include mistakes uh, was a mistake. It's going to put aggressors at a position of advantage in terms of gun violence in our streets. I'm someone who brought the uh, chief of police from Pleasant Hill, the chief of police from Des Moines, the two communities that I represent, to the legislature. When we're talking about gun violence in our communities, we have to bring law enforcement into the discussion. And so when we start talking about things that we could do, we have to look at two of the most harmful things that were done recently in repealing those changes. Uh, we also want to make sure we have background checks. We want to make sure that we're addressing problems while also making sure that we're preserving the rights of all the gun-owning households that we have across Iowa that do it the right way and responsibly. 
Well, I think it's a public health issue. I've, I've been in ERs where you see the, the effect of gun violence. But I also would tell you, if I was on an acreage, I'd want a shotgun. But that's not the rights we're talking about. We're talking about the rights to be able to go to a movie or to go to a concert and not be, not be hurt. So what I would do is look at common sense gun laws, which I think we haven't done enough of. We do have some of these laws that we've done. We've gone the opposite direction of what I would do. I would come over and do more background checks and common sense gun laws that would make sure that we're not having this public health emergency. John Norris, you've talked a great deal in this campaign about the need for Democrats to reach out to rural Iowans. How do you be strongly anti-gun and still attract votes from rural Iowans? Be sensible about it. Listen, Kim Reynolds, D Department of Human Services proposed a rule that would require daycare providers when they parents dropped their children off in the morning that they had to notify them that there were guns in the home and they were secured. What parent wouldn't be entitled to know that or expect to know that? And Governor Reynolds struck that rule. That's Ross, what people want is common sense. Ross Wilbur. As someone who uh, has served in the military and knows how to fire uh, a lot of these weapons of war and that's what they are, it is sensible gun ownership and it shouldn't be easier to get uh, you know, a weapon of war than it is to get your driver's license. So a lot of members of the NRA know, how, know about the, the background checks and the loopholes. We, loopholes. we can do those. We can put that in place. Mr. Hubble? Well, that's a very personal issue for me. Um, I have eight county sheriffs that are supporting our campaign because they know I'm, I'm a strong believer in public safety. But they also know that I've actually had automatic weapons pointed at me and pointed at my wife. So I've seen what those weapons can do. I've seen somebody get shot dead, you know, no farther away than You're talking some about of these people when are. you were held hostage. Yes. So, you know, I've, I've seen up close what these weapons can do and, and what people can do when they have these kind of weapons. And when our governor says that we have reasonable laws and that we don't need to talk about it because it's a federal issue, she's wrong on both counts. We don't have reasonable laws. And the last two years, we've seen a lot of new laws introduced in our state, mostly by out-of-state interests, trying to protect gun owners at the expense of public safety. Okay. When you see it up close, you realize how serious public safety is, and this governor doesn't understand that. Kathy Clausen. Uh, you know, we have folks uh, pontificating about how they are on common sense gun reform, although I'm the only Democratic candidate that came out in November of last year talking about common sense gun reform. Uh, and I'm the first Democratic gubernatorial candidate that uh, received the candidate of distinction from Moms Demand Action. Leaders lead on issues. I was clear and am clear about my position on gun violence. As a nurse, I've seen it. Every 39 hours in this state, an Iowan is killed by a firearm. Full ban on assault rifles. We need a 72-hour waiting period, comprehensive and thorough background checks on every gun sale in Iowa, because there is no radical notion that when a parent sends their child to school that they will come home at the end of the day. I want to switch to kind of a closing round of questions here. We've asked our questions. What did we leave out? What did we miss? Let's let everybody have a minute to say. John Norris, what, have, what has been overlooked by the reporters here? We definitely didn't get enough into mental health. I think we've all recognized you can't travel to this state and not realize what a failure our mental health system is. How many, nearly every community is impacted by it, nearly every family. It's impacting our workforce. It's limiting our businesses and manufacturers to be able to grow because they need workers desperately. As long as our economic development strategies lure out-of-state businesses here with tax cuts, it's not sustainable because we're not able to invest in education and mental health care to make sure we're breaking that cycle of poverty for families in this state and get people on the right track. And we've really, I think, failed to address that most critical issue tonight. The trouble? What have we overlooked? Well, absolutely, mental health is the biggest issue in our state. That combined with substance abuse. You hear about it in every place you meet somebody, so that's a big issue. But there's another one. That's rural Iowa. What are we going to do to help rural Iowa? Uh, because everything this governor is doing, from the fiscal mismanagement to the misguided priorities, underfunding this, this, and this, is just squeezing the life out of rural Iowa bit by bit by bit. And it's very deliberate. She doesn't admit it, but it's very deliberate. So we need a governor who's going to step up and defend rural Iowa, who's going to go to work for rural Iowa, and who's going to invest in rural Iowa, and who's going to go out and take, take uh, uh, producers and, and, and growers and agricultural workers from across our state to Canada and to Mexico and to Latin America and start to develop our own re direct relationships with these countries rather than waiting to see what somebody in D.C. does. We need a leader who's going to stand up and work for rural Iowa as well as work for mental health. Nate Bolton. 
Uh, I think those are two good points. Rural Iowa economic development has been horribly lacking from this administration. Mental health is an embarrassment. This is an administration that shut down two of our state's four mental health facilities and did nothing to replace the lost services. And I was proud to take that case all the way to the Supreme Court where I argued against it and then introduced legislation that would have reopened those facilities. But also I think we're missing out on education. We've got eight years underfunding our schools. We've told our teachers they're not going to see wage increases that keep up with inflation. They'll have less and less of a voice in health insurance. How do we recruit the next generation of qualified teachers into our classrooms, into our rural Iowa classrooms, when they know that their wages their first year will be the best wages they will get because they won't keep up with the cost of living? Andy McGuire, what have we overlooked here? Well, I, I think they're right on mental health. I'm the only one with a comprehensive mental health plan on my website, McGuire for Governor, that honestly knows what we need to do to start to attack this crisis. I, I think uh, there's other you know, good uh, ideas about education, respecting our public teachers, and making sure they have the resources they need. One subject we haven't talked about at all is climate change. And I think it's something that's really, we have to address. We had a climate action committee that we used to have under democratic control. We then disbanded it. We didn't. Republicans disbanded it. I think we should put it back in so that we can get greenhouse gases reduced by 80% by the year 2050. Ross Wilburn, what's been overlooked? We didn't talk, we didn't talk enough about uh, supporting uh, the elderly in Iowa. Now, many of these issues, health care, um, um, uh, you know, the environment impacts them, but uh, you know, rural homelessness, um, services support for, for seniors, we didn't get enough into that. And we need to do a better job educating them on how all of these issues uh, you know, support and, and touch them. Kathy Glossop. Uh, we touched on health care, but I still don't know where my opponents stand on actually making sure that Iowans have affordable, quality health care. I don't know what that means. Um, I'm still proud to be the only candidate talking about universal, single-payer health care that's very clear in what I'm saying. Uh, so I'm still very confused about uh, how we're going to do that. My plan will cover mental health services as well as reproductive health services. So as far as I'm concerned, we've talked about mental health care in the state of Iowa. What we didn't touch on is higher education, public education, and climate change, because we know we have such a mountain of student debt out there as well. We've got just a few minutes left of six candidates. So very, very quickly, Kathy Glosson, and we'll talk for a little bit. Uh, what's the most important thing you want Democrats to remember about you as they head into the polls? That being in the middle centrist uh, candidate and policies will not win for Democrats. We have lost 11 out of the last 14 governor's races in this <clears throat> state by staying safe in the middle and not looking forward and looking back at what we've done. We need to actually stand up and fight against status quo establishment politics. And Iowans want that and they want leaders that are willing to be forward thinking. And may, they deserve more than what they're getting under the current system with the party, the way the party is addressing issues. Ross Wilbur. What should Democrats remember about you as they go to the polls? In addition to all of the experiences that I have, I want you to just kind of reposition and think about uh, funding. We've had well-funded Democrats that have lost in this state. And um, as was said before earlier by John, that uh, in, the, in the end, Democrats will come together to put forth our candidates. So I think ex experience matters. I think our ideas matter, that, that the person matters. So I ask you to consider that. Very quickly. Andy McGuire. I think this is about our, my seven kids and one grandchild, your kids and grandchildren. It's about the future of Iowa. It's about making sure our kids and grandkids can stay here and be successful, that they have good, affordable access to health care, that they have good education, world-class education, that they have good-paying jobs with good benefits and good, clean water and air. Senator Bolton. That I didn't wait for Terry Branstad to go off to China before standing up to this administration. And while I've been proud of the things that I've done to stand up to this administration, we're not going to win in 2018 if we don't start talking about what our vision forward for the future are. We create the Iowa that we want for the future today, and that's why I'm running for governor. Fred Hubble, what, what did we forget? Or what, what, what do you want Democrats to remember as they go into the polls? Well, I've never run for office before. I've never been a politician. So I don't have any special interest. None. What I want to do is try to unify people in this state. Because as I said earlier, we, we're going to need to bring people together to win the election and, and to get anything done as we're, as we're going to be governing. So I want to find that common ground and, and get results for people. And I think I've demonstrated I know how to do that in a lot of different sectors. You've got to put people first. If you don't have special interests, you can put people first. You don't have to worry about some vote or some group to support you because you can put the people first and do what's right for people, which means education and health care and infrastructure investments all across our state. And I want to go back to the tax issue a little bit because I described Quickly. many different ways that we could actually 
save money in this state to put into those categories. And that should be done first. We, we can all talk about reversing this tax cut that they came up with, but there are some good things in there, and we should address the, the existing problems before we take a look at how to deal with that tax Thank cut. You. John Norris, same I question. I disagree. Throw it away and start over. I'm sorry, what did you say? I say I, I disagree with Freddie. We got to throw, throw that tax cut away and start over. All right. um, well, what what but, do you want Democrats to remember? Absolutely, about you? and I, I appreciate my colleagues here mentioning rural Iowa, but I want them to know that I am unapologetically passionate about rural Iowa. We cannot afford to sustain, sustain the human and physical infrastructure of this entire state just with the Des Moines Ames Iowa City Cedar Rapids corridor. And if we're going to win this governor's race, and this isn't about just win the governor's, governor's race for me, I'm in this for the long haul to lead this state and empower progressive legislators to get elected as well. Because it's going to take years to undo the damage they've done. And my commitment is to be the governor that changes the conversation in this state, wins back those rural votes, and enables legislators across the state to get elected so we can make those changes. The people who will vote on June 5th will be voting under a new system requiring voter verification. Raise your hand if you would repeal that law that was passed by a Republican <laughs> legislature. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what, <right? laughs> um, what's wrong with showing an ID to vote, Mr. Norris? Sorry? What is wrong with showing We've an ID to vote? got less than a minute. Showing what? An ID to vote. It intimidates people. We should be inviting people to vote. Mr. Hubble? There are a lot of people who don't own a car, so they don't have a driver's license. They don't travel, so they don't have a passport. And they may have changed their address, so that what they send out to the mail may never show up there. Mr. Bolton? Disproportionate impact on elderly, minorities, and uh, people that have already hard enough time getting access and to the ballot. It's addressing a problem that doesn't exist. There wasn't fraud to begin with, why we did this. This was just to limit voting, and we should make voting for everyone possible. Ross We don't want Jim Crow laws in Iowa. Let's be Iowa. <laughs> quickly. Very, quick, very quickly. Clearly voter suppression and intimidates certain uh, groups of Iowa voters so they cannot express their small-D democracy. And we are out of time. Thank, Thank you, you all for, for being here tonight. <laughs> And I, wanna, I also want to thank you for joining us for our Iowa Press debate for the Democratic gubernatorial primary. And stay tuned to political coverage on Iowa Press every week at our regular times, Friday night at 7.30 and Sundays at noon on statewide Iowa public television or anytime at IPTV.org. For our entire hardworking crew here at the Maytag Auditorium in Johnson, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us tonight. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.